Rising oil prices means that we're going to see a lot more bummed out craft beer drinkers. Rising oil prices will disappoint drinkers of craft beers, you're saying? That is correct. Rising oil prices will disappoint craft beer drinkers, which technically you are right now, a little bit more. Sorry about that. Welcome to the knock-on effect. This is where we start with the thing you know and end up in a weird place. I'm Justine Underhill, and today we have joining us our educated gasser, Alex Rosenberg. Okay. You get it? Yeah, sort of. Guesser, gasser, yeah, yeah, no, no. And we have our Petro professor joining us from an undisclosed location, Roger Hurst. Hello, Alex, and hello, Justine. Hey there, today you are donning... Is it graduation day over there? Or? It's full-on professorial robes. Really? I thought I'd be I mean, with a big bushy beard and the, the pot belly as uh, most real ale drinkers would be. Oh, no, no, no. Today you look, you look very uh, fancy. Yes, it looks, it looks like you're, this picture could be hanging up in... in... The halls of Harvard, or Oxford. Well, I, that's, well, Whoa, well, I hope, yeah. well, I'm actually off to Oxford this weekend, so hopefully you know, that will oh. be the appropriate attire. All right, very well, we, we can ship this to you. Maybe you can just sneak it onto one of the walls and they won't even notice. That would be cute. Yeah. All right, we have a lot to get to today. Um, but before we get to why craft beer drinkers are going to be a little bit more bummed, okay. um, I do want to announce that we have our final segment today, which is where Alex will explore a topic in the world of academia. And don't worry, it's less interesting than it sounds. Oh no. And you're going to delve and tell us all the nuances of a crazy financial paper that, that just came out. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Cool. It'll be really wild. Okay. Now back to our main deal. We have why rising oil prices are going to lead to issues in the craft brewing industry. Okay. Okay. So I just want to set up the scene a little bit. So we've had oil prices rising to levels we haven't seen since 2014. These are crazy prices going on. Analysts didn't expect this to happen. Mm -hmm. We have hit $70 a barrel, even above, and that's a big deal in this world. Do you want to try taking a guess as to why oil prices will lead to bummed out craft beer drinkers? So oil prices will lead to, to uh, uh, gasoline to become more expensive. And um, as, as people, so people might, you know, put less in their tanks each time. So every time they go to the gas station, the, you know, they'll maybe buy their beer at the gas station instead of the, instead of the liquor store. And they don't have such an amazing selection at most gas stations nowadays. So you'll just have, end up buying Coors Light. I mean, or another brand. Professor, I'm going to turn this over to you. What grade do you give that? Well, it, it was fairly convoluted. And, uh, and given, <laughs> given it was... It was, uh, substance was fairly weak. For, you know, form was okay. I, I kind of like where you went from and didn't end up anywhere. So I'll give that. Actually, I'm going to go to a D. Oh, Whoa. Okay, it wow, was that's... a diluted beer. What, what, what were you expecting from that? I mean, you know, a, a, good, a good answer and a long answer, not the same thing. Oh, ouch. Oh, the, the grading God. system in the UK is a little yeah, bit more I know. harsh. I know. Okay. So let's get to our first knock on effect. Okay. So rising oil prices means that more frackers will come online. Okay, so we're gonna wow, see more really fracking left turn here. in the US. Professor, what are some of the numbers? Kind of big numbers, or I think they're reasonably big numbers anyway. So uh, there's a backlog of around about 7,000 wells that have already been drilled, but they have not yet been fracked. So they're just sitting there kind of a bit desolate and lonely. And since oil companies have now started to, well, they've already spent the money to drill them. And now that oil prices are rising, as you mentioned, these operators are likely to try fracking this backlog. 7,000 lonely wells. Drilled and forgotten. Yeah, drilled and forgotten. And also these frackers have gotten a little bit more efficient in terms of the pricing. So wh what's going on right now in terms of break-even pricing, Roger? Yeah, so break-even, I mean, firstly, what is break-even? That's the amount of money that I, I, I kind of, um, for which an asset is sold to cover both the cost of acquiring and owning it. So break-even is this sort of level where people really focus on. And in 2013, that used to be $70 a barrel. And today it's less than $40 a barrel. And that's the efficiency that we've mm. been seeing driven through this industry. So then if, if oil prices are rising and the break even is going down, why are so many of these frack, fracking sites going on un, frack? Well, so they, a lot of them are waiting for the oil price to rise. I will mention that a lot of oil um, 
firms had been hedged. So they're not necessarily as profitable now, even uh, though oil uh, prices have been going up. But we do expect a lot of these oil wells to come online back in online. the future. Okay. So now it's time to get to the next knock-on effect. All right. An increase in fracking means an increase in sand usage. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that's, no, this is a big thing. I know, I know. Okay. I, oh, it's wow. like you expected me to say it with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so fracking, so fracking sand is mixed with water and all other chemicals, creates a slurry, it gets pumped into the ground. It's okay. called propant because okay. it literally props the rocks open so that oil and gas can escape. Okay. So that's how it works. Uh, and a lot of these frackers are using more and more sand. Professor, can you fill us in on, on what's going on in this industry? Yeah, it's, it's a critical part of the shale drilling revolution has uh, been the usage of sand. And so what happens is as drilling accelerates, which it is doing now, and uh, oil wells get longer, um, more sand is used per foot of the well. So not only are you seeing more wells coming online, but the wells themselves are using more and more sand. So there's this, this just, mm. it's not quite exponential, but there's a very significant uh, uptick in the usage of sand. 10 million pounds of sand it can take to frack a well in West Texas, hmm. which is a huge amount. Is it coming from those beaches that we uh, we visited last week in the last Oh, that, that's effect? a good, a little good plug for our last week's episode. Um, no, it's actually not. It's coming a lot from Wisconsin and the Midwest, hmm. actually. So this is special wow. frack sand. But uh, this is a huge thing because frack sand prices have skyrocketed. They've increased by 60% over the past two years. So frack sand getting more expensive, but okay. this is part of actually a bigger issue is that Sand is one of our most used resources. It's actually the most used natural resource behind water and air. Wow. And it's a it's an often forgotten commodity yeah, that, that I, we I, use. You, you don't, don't think even think about of it as a commodity, now. no. Um, but we use tens of billions of tons of sand every year. And guess what? We are running out of usable sand. That sounds that sounds bad. That's yeah. scary. This is, it's a it's a whole it's a huge deal. Actually, Professor, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Well, it does sound bonkers, but sand is used in pretty much every aspect of modern life. And, you know, you have water, water everywhere, but sand comes a pretty good second. And if you think about it, it's in concrete. So every office tower and house uses concrete. It's in roads and doesn't use obviously as much, but silicon chips in your computer use it. And Alex, you're pretty, you know, you're improving your opportunities here because you're actually right, you know, when you're talking about beaches, it's water um, eroded sand that's the most commonly demanded. So riverbeds and beaches. And these are the ones that are being stripped. And governments are cracking down in response. What is this? It's turned into, it's spawned a worldwide black market in sand. People are being imprisoned. People are being tortured and murdered over sand. This is a crazy what? economy. You should, I, I so, highly suggest looking it up because it just, it, it gets pretty insane. No longer there safe to make sand castles. Yeah. There, no, there are, there are sand mafias, basically. Uh, uh, I have so many questions. First of all, <laughs> billions of tons. I didn't even know we had billions of tons of anything. Yeah. Um, but so, how? I'm really having, having, this is, I mean, isn't sand like, must be relatively cheap. How is there a black market? Like, how do you sneak sand in? You have to have a lot of it for it to be worth anything. Yeah, so many questions. Okay, so a huge part of this goes to the fact that uh, desert sand is not is too fine to be used. So if you think about it, a lot of um, buildings use uh, concrete, and using concrete means you're using a huge amount of sand, and that sand stays there. So as soon as you build a building, it's not like that sand goes back into the environment, it's in that building. Okay. And so we are using so much of it. And so actually, India has become a huge problem where people are basically siphoning off sand, specifically rivers, specifically beaches, um, and using that for construction sand. So a lot of this is going into construction. Okay. But, and this brings up an important point, not all sand is created equal. So we have exhibit A. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Jesus. <laughs> okay, so exhibit A is sand. Take a look at this. So we have a bunch of different <laughs> types of sand here. Okay. And you know, we have um, one type of sand, which is a little bit more rough. And that's what you oftentimes use in construction. Okay. And so that's not the same as the sand that's used in fracking, which is silica sand. And so in fracking, you want things that are a little bit more even and round. Um, and so that's, that's what you find oftentimes in Wisconsin. So they're not the same. They're not used in the same markets. 
And because of that, do you want to take a guess <laughs> as to who also uses the silica sand? Yeah, and... this feels nicer. This is a lot more like... Yeah, it's a little smoother. Yeah. Well, and so that's the thing is that they, they're, compl they're different markets, basically. You find them in completely different places. So construction sand can also be wet. It can be taken from wet places. Uh, fracking sand has to be dried, and that's a hugely mm. expensive and costly process. I would not I would not inhale that. It smells that. good. I would not inhale that. It's nice. That. It's like a little salty. Anyway, so, The yeah. terroir you, is certainly you... Wisconsin rather than Illinois, though. I can, I can tell you my, can, my can... sand. Oh, okay. Yes, Wisconsin sand has a certain... Our sommelier here. Yeah. Uh, who else uses fracking sand? I, I mean, I, brewers, brewers, that's what I'm guessing. Why would they be using it? <laughs> well, now you got me. <laughs> okay, because glass producers use oh. a lot of fracking sand. Oh, nice, okay. okay. So because frackers um, are taking away glass sand, you. Yeah. you want to take a guess? This you is your final chance for a guess. Oh, frackers are taking away glass sand, so glass bottles are going to become more expensive. Yay! And so, but I don't know why. why but, uh, yeah, keep, keep okay, going. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. So I'm going to guide you a little bit farther. Yeah. I actually I talked to a geologist who specializes in sand. He was so excited to talk to me about all the different. <laughs> He's waiting around the phone all year. I know that call is coming. Someone yeah, has a I really good question about me. sand. He was super. excited. No, nope, another telemarketer. <laughs> no, here it comes. No, no, that's my aunt. No, here yeah. it comes. Oh, Justine! He was so excited to okay. tell me all the differences. And so it was interesting because he actually mentioned craft brewers okay. um, as, as increasing demand for a lot of the silica sand that's used to make glass. And he mentioned specific mines that actually were serving glass makers that went to serve frackers. And so hmm. there has been wow. a significant increase in price and it impacts craft brewers. Final knock-on effect. Okay. Okay, craft brewers yes. use a lot of glass. They use glass bottles for their beer. That is the oh. primary method that they use to transport their liquid. <laughs> and so... You should not do marketing for craft <laughs> brewers. We use glass to transport our liquid. liquid. Sounds good. And so that's been a huge thing. And okay. they've been changing over to cans. That's why you'll find your craft beer in cans. I mean, it is... It is cheaper option for them for several reasons because mm -hmm. of transportation costs and other things. Right. But that's why craft beer drinkers will be a little more bummed. They prefer their their liquid in bottles. Yeah, because but but because glass bottles they don't transmit all the all the like you never see water in cans unless you're on an airplane or something. Right? Oh yeah. So 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 because I, I seltzer water. Right, but usually it's flavored because I, if doesn't the, the doesn't the uh, can impart some of the the tinny flavor? There's been so many advancements in can technology. Totally serious. That did you also talk to a geologist about this for a I couple hours? I did a hours? lot of research on cans okay. and craft brewers and why they're switching over. It's actually it doesn't leak flavor or anything. They have new linings that prevent that, so it's actually um, a lot more effective mm. for them to use. So cans. it's good for the can makers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very American problem because in the UK, the, the real ales are served in big kegs, which are put up on the wall. So we don't have it in bottles or cans. I mean, that's just... Because here we only have 12 to 40 ounces at a time. Whereas <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so any takeaways here? Wow. Uh, oh, brother. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm still... This absorbing is actually, all of it? Yeah, I'm still absorbing all the, all the sand. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is fascinating. Um, what, what are your takeaways? Sure. Okay. So I, I'm going to, I want to take a little bit of a step back. Yeah, please. Okay. So basically fracking and the sand production has spurred so many different industries. Uh, and this has far reaching consequences. So as we saw with craft brewers, but it, it's even bigger than that. Uh, Roger, what are, what are some of the other industries that are affected here? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of industries that have been impacted by this. I mean, the obvious ones that we've talked about um, already are, are, are kind of the glass industries, but it's, it's really, it's the railroads where we're seeing this kind of this interesting area. The railroads, I think, it's, as you say, it's, it's around about, I think, 5% of revenue. So Union Pacific, for example, that's the largest listed railroad road company. And, and it's, it's a big part of the revenues. They're getting impacted because a lot of this is going back onto trucks. So truckers are, are benefiting from this and the big railroads are losing out. So, so basically what's happening is because sand prices have increased so much, uh -huh. frackers are trying to find more cost-efficient ways to, to produce sand. Um, and so they're actually producing them in, in Texas and, and mining sand in Texas rather than Wisconsin. And so that has potential impacts on railroad companies. And so as Roger mentioned, 
5% of Union Pacific's uh, revenue comes from sand mine. Can, can I ask you another question, which is, can you make this or this uh, sand in a lab or uh, in, no. a, in a factory? Actually, no, absolutely not. And so that's the thing, it's just, it is so much more, there's, it, we use tens of billions of tons of sand every year. You can't just, there's no material in the world where mm. you can just, oh, like, just like, make there's not billions much. of tons of something lying around. Okay, and so, you know, but this has even bigger impacts than, like, let's say just railroads. It's even farmland because sand has gotten so expensive. Farmland in Wisconsin is more profitable to mine for sand than to have a farm. Ooh, and that's so that's changing the landscape. And so wow. this just has like so many different impacts on our landscape, wow. on businesses. I mean, this is basically fracking and oil has created all these different industries that are now reliant on each other. <laughs> Can't get enough of that good Wisconsin sand though. That's... I know, it's that, that, um, that silica is like some of the best. <laughs> it really is. Northern white sand, that's like... Uh... I love that you actually know this. Yeah, so. I did so much research. Um, so yeah, that does it for the knock-on effect. Meanwhile, kids, you hear this sound? You know what that means. It's time for our new segment, The Annals of Finance. Yay! <laughs> kids love Annals of Finance. So uh, this is where we look at something that's recently been published in a financial journal. Finance is, is constantly evolving. There's a lot of academic work on it. And this is where we, we highlight some of that work. So. This is a paper recently accepted in the Journal of Finance. It's been floating around for a while, but it's called A Tough Act to Follow Contrast Effects in Financial Markets. Ooh. <laughs> by two writers named uh, Samuel Hartz, Mark, and Kelly Hsu. And what they found is, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let, them, let them say it. Investors mistakenly perceive information from earnings announcements in contrast to what preceded it, so that the return reaction to an earnings announcement is inversely related to the levels of earnings surprise announced by large firms the previous day. Okay, so English, please. Uh, so, so let's say that uh, Goldman Sachs just reported their earnings on Thursday, and Morgan Stanley is going to report on Friday. If Goldman Sachs' earnings were surprisingly bad, then no matter what Morgan Stanley's earnings are, it'll be seen as better. Uh, as better. Whereas if Goldman Sachs reported blowout amazing earnings, then Morgan Stanley's earnings would be seen as worse. It, it, think about it like if you walked outside and it was kind of a cloudy day, if the day before was absolutely beautiful, you'd be like, oh my God, the weather's terrible. Whereas if the day before was raining, you'd be like, oh my God, such great weather. Right, so it's all, it's all relative, basically. Yes, and, and so, but, but it's kind of uneconomical. Like, it, people aren't responding rationally to the new information. They're sort of just, you know, their brain is telling them, oh, this is really good because, but it's really well, because it's the other one was based on how their competitors are doing. Yes, but, but, but actually, if you bought a, a company the day before earnings when other companies reported good earnings, you, you actually do worse than if you bought a company the day before earnings when other companies reported bad earnings. Ah. And 50 days after the announcement, we do see the effect reverse, so, that, so it does correct. So you could trade this? You could, now, they actually found that if you did a strategy of only buying companies about to report when other companies reported bad earnings and, only, and shorting companies about to report when other companies reported yeah. uh, good earnings, you actually would make 15% a year. Now, don't try this at home because Aww. there's trading costs and it, it's, it's not things. necessarily the best strategy in the world. It's something you could consider when you're making a trade. Yeah, I, I think the best way to think about this, really, this paper, is this is a mistake that people make. Um, maybe don't buy, I wouldn't use it to, to buy in short stocks. I'd use it to think about, am I only thinking these earnings are good because yesterday's earnings are uh, bad? That's pretty cool. Professor? Well, I definitely think that this is very much a, a niche or you might say a niche uh, type of market. I don't think, I wouldn't advise anyone to rush out there, uh, get their hands on this and spend their time reading the 63 pages, but it's very, very clear that what they're talking about is, is very much just a sort of fact of the financial market. But it really boils down to two words. One is, it's a bit semantics, the word perceptions versus expectations. And they say that this is a contrast in the effects as an error in perception rather than an error in expectation. And in that, you've pretty much boiled it down. I think the other 63 pages, well, you know, I'm not sure I'd be going reading them. I, I will say it was a very good paper. It almost as interesting as talking to a geologist about sand for oh. half an hour. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, but, uh, I think, Alex, you need, you need to get out more. <laughs> but, um, but, but I will say it's, it's something that it, it's just, it happens in financial markets, but it's not really a financial markets effect. It's we behave in a kind of silly way by, it, and it happens in other aspects of life. They, they talk about if you are going on speed dates and the person, 
is you just went on a speed date with, with really attractive, the person you're now on a speed date with, you'll see is less attractive and, and vice versa. Wow. So it's just a way that our, yeah. our mind works because we're just relating things to other things. I love it when trading relates to dating and weather. <laughs> well, this is your lucky day. Oh my God. <laughs> this, is, I, this is exciting. Yeah. Thanks, so, thanks think, so much for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. The annals of finance. <laughs> All right, that's all right. All right. By the way, Scott, you want to uh, grab a beer here? Oh, yeah. Here oh. we go. All right, let's, let's all let's all toast I'll while toast. we're uh, around to another successful. Uh, Not gonna affect. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what they Whatever say. <laughs> but um, this is we are released every Thursday on RealVision.com. You can also find us on the. What do you think of the beer? It's really good. All right, good. You can also find us on the uh, podcast app, your, whatever your podcast app is, under Real Vision Presents. And if you want more on finance and the economy, you should check out realvision.com slash knockoneffect where you can sign up for your 14-day free trial. It's a good deal. Yeah. Almost as good as this beer. I don't know. All right. See you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>